clear. Okay, what do you can do with this one? Well, sweep the ones off the landing board. The others look good? Yes. Good job. So now if we collected this bee and we brought it inside and put it on the kitchen table, would it warm up and fly again? Yes. It would? Why don't you collect a handful of them? Um, I'm not really going to bucket. I'll get something to carry them in first. Get something to carry them in? Yeah, Why? What do you think they'll do? I don't know. You think they warm up in your hand and sting you? Yes. Or bite. Well, that's the truth. Or, or bite me. I don't feel like you're bit today. Now you're blocking my sunlight again. I'm going to head in the way to get All right, then. So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, December the 1st. That's right. November's already gone. This is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 235. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So I'm really glad that you're here and uh, spending your valuable time. I hope that you get something useful out of this. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description. All the topics will be listed in order and there will be some links there for your convenience if you decide that there's something that we mentioned that you might want to go shopping for. It is December after all, so hopefully you're not behind. Uh, if you want to submit a topic of your own for consideration for next Friday, please go to thewaytobe.org and click on the page titled The Way to Be. There's a form there that you can fill out. So let's see, that's pretty much it. I think we're ready to go, except for the weather conditions outside. 37 degrees Fahrenheit right now. It's rainy. So yesterday it was super snowy, thus the opening sequences, which were all filmed yesterday, and my supervisor showed up to make sure that the landing boards of the beehives were cleared. And of course, we collected bees from the snow, and we brought them inside and we put them on the kitchen table because they were all dead after all. And, uh, of course, before you know it, we had a kitchen full of bees flying around. So, there's that. Uh, winds are 3.1 miles an hour. It's going to rain all weekend, by the way. The snow has melted off now, almost completely already. We had over a foot of snow. 98% relative humidity. No big surprise, because uh, it's raining. And it's going to rain. So, it's going to be, would you rather have rain or snow? I don't know. Once we get to this time of year, it's probably okay to go either way. But I prefer snow than wet. Let's go right on to the very first question, which comes from Steve Orangeville, Ontario, Canada. When you discussed a poor service of the plywood bottom boards, even treated boards failed early. Did you have a comparison between different types of treatments? Wax, dipped, blue nose varnish, eco wood, etc. Also, if a landing board is too small, 
clamp a hive visor down there and your design upside down would prove uh, to have edge rims too. So in other words, he's saying the hive visor, uh, which screws onto the sides of your hive, it just clamps on there. You flip that upside down and put it underneath the hive that has no landing board and voila, you have one. I hadn't thought of that, so cool for Steve on that innovation. The thing is, a lot of companies sell uh, bottom boards for your beehives and beehive in this case, we're talking about the Langstroth hives where we put bottom boards on them. And uh, some of them are solid wood, which means they're dimensional lumber, usually one by sixes, you know, one in front of the other sideways. And uh, the other are the laminates. So we're talking plywood. Now plywood comes in a lot of different grades and I'm not gonna mention the company that I purchased mine from, but very well known, big supplier of bee equipment. And so the question was, did I treat, I treated them all with eco wood. So they all had the same treatment. Now, um, eco wood doesn't do a great job of protecting laminate material. So if you've got a plywood hive, for example, Eco wood is a treatment, not a finish. Therefore, it's not going to prevent your laminations, which are 90 degrees from each other. That's why you have big sheets of stable material. It doesn't shrink. Um, it does delaminate. So if you were going to use laminate material, you would have to paint it or do something else to it. Now, I don't personally like to paint the surfaces of the bottom board where it's going to be inside the hive. Eco wood is, is okay all over your hive once it's dry. And uh, the thing of it was, I didn't get two years out of those bottom boards. And the reason is, of course, the end grain of the laminate material that's facing the front of your hive is exposed to the weather. And um, it just started to degrade. And even the bees chewed through it. I was going to bring in one that looks like it's really been chewed apart by the bees. Uh, they just don't hold up considering that they are roughly the same price as dimensional lumber that composes your bottom boards, the so solid bottom boards. In the future, of course, I want to use uh, solid bottom boards under screens. So I want screens, removable tray under that, and then a solid bottom board under that. Now, right now, uh, the few that are out there are very expensive. So it's something you may want to start thinking about making on your own. I'm going to be building my own for now until somebody comes up with one. And um, the solid boards come in a variety of materials, pine, cedar, and so on. And I think Better Bee had a sale on cedar bottom boards two years ago, so I bought a pile of them because cedar doesn't require treatment at all. And of course, they're still doing great. Now, even though cedar doesn't require treatment, I, still, I just dip everything. If it's wooden and it's going on a hive, I dip it in eco wood because the eco wood is just uh, convenient, goes on like water, and uh, makes everything look natural, makes the wood look dark and weathered, and it prevents it from rotting. It does not prevent cupping, warping, stuff like that. That comes down to your construction ability and the quality of the material that you use. So the thing is, the solid bottom boards, the very first hive equipment that I got was that was just handed to me many years ago, prior to 2006 um, and that bottom board is still good including the telescoping cover which looked homemade the whole thing did it was dimensional lumber they had tin on the top and uh, it's still going so dimensional lumber outperforms laminate material when it comes to the bottom boards on your hives now there are high-end laminates but nobody's going to buy those for a beehive i mean somebody might i don't know but uh, there's marine grade plywood. The other thing is that uh, when you're putting woodwork on your hive or that you're going to have something that's in contact with your bees, I don't recommend ever using pressure treated lumber because some people go to that thing. It's going to last a long time. But remember that that's designed to defend itself against insects and things like that too. So why even risk it? Get your lumber untreated. And there you go. But as far as did I check it with wax dipping or blue nose varnish and so on? No. I did not try any of those other things for the bottom board. I did have Helmsman's on one years ago. The Helmsman's varnish did not hold up. That requires maintenance about every three years. So spar varnish, marine spar varnish. So that's pretty much it for that. Um, I won't be buying any more laminate uh, plywood style bottom boards ever again.
unless something really cool comes out and it's going to hold up. Question number two comes from Shelly from uh, Andover, New Jersey. I've assembled the Vivo Sun 8x8 tent and have a heater in there to warm up my honey. So far, so good. And that's good because that's what I use. Vivo Sun are for growing plants indoors, but I use that as my honey dehydrator. So because you can roll a cart on wheels, it's got wire shelves on it, and you can put all your honey on there. And you can dry it down by putting a dehumidifier in it, nice controlled space. And if you want to, you could probably use it as designed to grow flowers too. So anyway, it says, I have a question. A guy stopped by to buy a jar of honey and told me he and his father were beekeepers years ago. And he gave me this tip. He said, if you have hilly property, always put the bees at the top of the hills. He said the bees will not fly uphill to forage. That seems like a weird concept. I have a hilly property and have the bees situated about halfway up. The fields are filled with flowers. I did not see the honeybees in the upper fields. I have seen other pollinators uphill. Is he right? I would not like to move the bees up further as it gets icy and slippery and so on. So I can say this. Generally, I don't like to get into settling disputes. You know what I mean? When somebody comes through and says, hey, man, this is what happens, except that this is very far off the mark. I don't think a lot of people are worried about this. Bees definitely forage uphill. Think of it this way. If you have trees in your yard and they're flowering trees, the same foraging limitation would apply. If the beehive has to be at the highest point of the forage, then any trees that are above the height of the hive would not be visited by the bees. See what I'm saying? Bees visit everything. So I think that's uh, for sure. You do not have to put your beehive on top of a hill and uh, to make sure that the bees can then forage everything at the height of your hive and down. So they definitely go up and down and in every direction. So little tidbits of information that people stop over to give. We were at uh, giving a presentation at an environmental center and people that see that there's a honeybee display, they like to come over and share the things they know for sure. They know this to be a fact. And so this is one of the things that often comes around. How do you know if that honey came from bees? And uh, I was a little bit put on the spot because my wife was all excited that someone came up to her and said, hey, this is how you find out if the honey that you have in this jar actually came from bees. You take a couple teaspoons, she said, you put it in a jar of water, and the honey goes to the bottom of the jar and forms hexagons. And that's how you know it actually came from real bees because honey, she said, has memory and will take on the hexagonal cell shape whenever it's put in water. And my wife was so excited. She wanted to make sure I knew about it and brought her over and introduced her to me and everything else. And uh, it was a difficult situation because there's no way that that's possible that that happens. If it were a piece of plastic that had been heated up, sometimes plastic, ABS plastic, has memory and when heated will go right back into its original shape. But unfortunately, that's not a way to tell if your honey is real. Moving on, number three. So always question everything. How do you know that? How does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense to you, think about it. Really? Find out. We don't want our beehives at the top of hills because that's where it's the windiest. That's where the weather conditions are the most challenging. We also don't want our beehives at the bottom of hills down in ravines where it's often going to be moist or there's going to be a lot of water runoff. If it's in a floodplain, an area that gets really wet different times of the year, spring thaw, think about things like that. You don't want your beehives down there. So you want to find a place that is somewhat sheltered, so not hilltop. And uh, you want to find a place where the ground never really gets saturated with standing water and things like that because we want your beehives to be able to dry out. So there are lots of things to consider, but altitude uh, compared to the adjacent landscape is not one of those critical things. Question number three. And this comes from Derek. Thanks again for the assistance today. I just finished watching your latest video. For a possible topic for your next video, 
and it relates to a comment you made about adding to diversity of an area when planting. Why do I want to plant a large planting of Cosmos, for instance, rather than a pollinator mix? This is a great question from Derek that comes up at a timely moment, really because a lot of people, if you're like me, I've bought all my seeds already. I am set for the coming year. So, because if you wait until spring, uh, the seed mixes that you want from the really good suppliers will often be completely out of stock and then you're frustrated and now you have to go with something that didn't get five star reviews or whatever. So the thing is, um, this happens a lot. People plant a certain type of flower in their yard and then the first thing they want to know is, hey Fred, they're not coming to these flowers. You said they would come to this kind of flower. Well, if you only have 20 blossoms in your yard, the bees don't consider that much of a resource because remember your honeybees are floral constant. So let's think about it. If your honeybees go out and they find thousands of dandelions in spring, that might not be the best nutrition out there, but dandelions provide pollen and nectar in abundance, right? So when your bees go out to a pollen source or a nectar source, the more of it and the better quality that it is, the more likely they are to go to it. This is why if you have a small plot, quarter acre, half acre, something like that, it's better to select just a couple of varieties that you can grow thousands of them because then those are sure to get the bees' attention because now hundreds if not thousands of bees will go to those blossoms and they'll take care of them for as long as they're in bloom, for as long as they're producing nectar and on it goes. So that's why, um, also look at the content when you see, cause I did, I bought um, this year, I bought uh, Northeastern Wildflower Meadow Mix. So it's perennials, annuals, everything together. And that's just for aesthetics. So for me personally, I put that out there and it gives me a part of my property to walk around on and see what comes to it. Because remember, here's the other part of beekeeping that I hope you keep in mind. We don't want to think only about the honeybees. We want to think about all pollinators. And the reason for that is we want to keep good relations with the nature tree huggers out there that want us to care about everything. Because remember, the honeybees are non-native. So we can come under the gun a little bit for having a non-native insect. Now, people like to go a step further and say non-native invasive honeybees. Okay, well, they're not invasive because there's something that we want here. We brought them here. They have a great use here. So the invasive part doesn't apply, but uh, non-native does. So if you can do things on your property that also support native pollinators, then you're going to be way ahead. Because here's one of the things that happens too. Uh, is there, for example, so much competition from your honeybees that you would push out native species from your property, from your flowers, right? Uh, not really, and the reason for that is uh, native bees. There are some specialists out there, for example, that will only go to sunflowers, but uh, most native bees or native pollinators, take the bumblebee for instance, right? They will go to every resource that there is. So they'll pollinate things that your honeybees can't even pollinate. Let me give you an example of one that was really interesting to me. Um, Oftentimes when people like to start off talking about bees, they say, I don't know, two out of every three uh, mouthfuls of food that you take is there because of honeybees, right? And then they'll start to list everything. And in the list of things, I always listen for it now because now that I know how it works, uh, they'll always say tomatoes. So they'll say, you know, all of your fruits and vegetables. Well, it's actually not true. This is pretty interesting. Honeybees can't pollinate tomatoes. So that's interesting because it's so frequently cited as something that we have because of the honeybees. But the flowers of the tomato are not accessible to the honeybee, therefore the honeybee can't get far enough in to do pollination and access the nectar and everything else. So what does? Bumblebees. So sometimes when you're out in your garden, if you grow vegetables, then uh, pay attention to your tomato plants next spring. Look at the honeybees and observe whether or not they go to those blossoms. And here's the thing, you'll hear some buzzing, you know, some real vibrating going on, heavy duty stuff. Not that would come from a honeybee, but something else, so it's bombus. it's the bumblebee. 
So they grab the flower and they hold on to it while they're, of course, trying to get nectar, but they vibrate it really heavy and that gets the pollen down onto the honeybee, onto the bumblebee, and then they pollinate the tomato plant. So look into that, by the way. And here's the problem with knowing that. Once you understand that some honeybees can't pollinate some of these vegetables that we cite all the time, um, then it's going to be a big question mark over your head every time somebody leads a presentation that way. So it's very interesting. But so diversity of, so if you do this prairie mix or whatever it is, then um, your all pollinators will come to it. But your honeybees might be in very low representation there. And that's because they go for a maximum resource in a minimum area closest to the beehive, closest to the apiary. And of course, when it comes to nectar, the highest sugar content is gonna win out. And that's not even a guarantee because the sugar content can be different percentage-wise throughout a single day from the same flower source. So planting your plants in clusters works out really well. So that's why bees need to find hundreds or thousands, the more of a single blossom that's of benefit to them the more likely you are to have your honeybees on it. And for those of you who can't keep honeybees, planting four honeybees is uh, really rewarding. So, but don't forget, planting for all pollinators is going to improve our relations with those who have a brighter scope of appreciation for the insect world beyond bees. Question number four comes from Lynn, Jones County, North Carolina. Hi Fred, I'm writing from coastal North Carolina where the small hive beetles can be a real bother. Have you ever seen a small hive beetle trap that hangs off a hive's landing board? I've been toying around with an idea that uh, would do this using a screed wire basket designed to catch and hold escaping larvae, yet let rain water pass through. So here's my thing uh, for people that, that know me at all. Uh, I don't have small high beetles, so I don't get to play with all these cool traps and stuff. But um, University of Florida, the Bee Lab, they do a lot of research along this line. And here's the thing, a lot of you are wondering, outside the hive, what good is that? Well, there are a lot of things I would, this is the approach I would have, that we want to, of course, interrupt uh, the small high beetles before they ever get into the hive. So if I had small high beetles, I would be very interested in entrance configurations that puzzle or frustrate or deter the entrance of the adult small hive beetle in the first place. So that's part of it. And the other part is once they get in, if they're reproducing and they have now, uh, these are larvae that would be coming out and uh, Dr. Jamie Ellis has fantastic research on this. And he talks about how agile those little larvae are because they go crawling out of the hive because they have to get into the ground to finish their reproduction. They have to metamorphose, go through metamorphosis in the soil. And the things that he talks about that they can cover and cross over and barriers that they overcome and everything else, I don't know, it would be cool if they would just crawl out and go right into some kind of screen trap and not be able to get out of it. That would be great but think of what's already happened inside the hive before they get to that state. So if they're at that point where they're, they've eaten a lot already, which means they probably slimed out your honey, and now they're on their way out to find soil, to get into the ground, to reproduce. This is also why, um, I mean, I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying you've kind of lost the war at that point. So dealing with them inside the hive is your second line of defense your primary boundary is the entrance itself. Configuration at the entrance, something to catch the adult beetle before it gets in. That would be where my focus would be. And then inside, trapping the beetles before reproduction, before there's a bunch of larvae scooting around inside your hive because they're already at the older phase when they're ready to go out. And as I said before, it get into the ground. Some people will spend a lot of time explaining why you need to put landscaping cloth under your hives and gravel under your hives and things like that to prevent the small hive beetle from completing that final metamorphosis in the ground. But if you listen to Dr. Ellis, um, they went out of a building where they were doing research, which was not even on the ground floor, by the way. So that means these little larvae went down the stairs, out the door, 
And then there's a parking lot and they went clear across the parking lot. I don't know how big the parking lot was. We need to talk to them more about this. And then until they found suitable soil and then in they went. So because they were following a trail of, you know, these larvae that were on the stairs, in the hall, on the parking lot and so on. And that's in Florida. So what I'm saying is at that point, they're very agile and mobile. And so there's nothing wrong with putting landscape cloth and stuff like that underneath your hives or gravel under your hives to suppress weeds and, you know, maybe help get things under control wherever you live. I don't personally do that. But if that was specifically a bunch of effort that you put into deterring small hive beetles, I think you kind of you're fighting the tide because they're ultimately going to find their way into the ground. So they don't have to go into the ground directly under your hives. They can go 100 yards. And remember, when they come out as mature beetles, they can smell a hive and fly for miles. So that's a that's a challenge. So I think the game for me would be keep them out of the hive. So entrance designs. And uh, oh look, I just happen to have like this, for example, is something I would probably use. And I forget what it was called, the beetle blocker or something like that. It's not labeled. But so these things frustrate the small hive beetles at the entrance. Keep them out of your hive. And then if they do get in, trap them as soon as possible with something that's attractive to the small hive beetle. And uh, beetle busters, beetle jails, there's a whole bunch of different stuff out there. And you want to know how much of a problem something is. Look at how many different potential solutions there are already for it. So for Lynn, I hope you try it. If it works, I want to know about it. If it doesn't work, then just pretend you never said anything and move on and then you won't have to own it. So, but let's get them well before that. So that was question number four. Question number five now comes from Thomas. He says, I asked my forest preserve friend if it's okay to buy a bunch of pollinating plant seeds from Amazon and throw them throughout the forest preserve. He went into a mild controlled panic and said, don't you dare. There are local seeds available from the forest preserve that won't cause harm to the forest and the seeds should come from plants within 25 miles. And by that, I think he meant native plants. He's the same guy I asked if it would uh, be good if I put wild beehives in the forest. And he said, no, because the native pollinators get crowded out, etc." Thought I was doing good for the forest. I'm glad I checked. I wish the people who brought over all the buckthorn had asked someone if it was a good idea to bring those over and so on. So here's the thing. This is a very good thing for Thomas and others to know about. And I'm glad that he shared that because um, I live right next to a bunch of game lands. Okay, so let's say that would be southwest of me. We have a bunch of game lands. Uh, we have a watershed that uh, is all wild, right? And so if we're beekeepers, we're thinking, oh yeah, if we could just get that all planted out for something that's really good for my bees, then I'd be set. But here's the thing, state of Pennsylvania, just for example, check in with your state's Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. Here's why that's good. In the state of Pennsylvania, by the way, if you want to plant something, anything, flowers, trees, shrubs, whatever, if you want to do it on game lands or state land, right? You have to obtain written permission from the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. It's the Bureau of Forestry, which is underneath that. Not only that, they'll tell you the best native plants, the things that they want the most of. And this takes you right down a rabbit hole. Uh, there's something about my property here. The road that I'm on is a cul-de-sac. And the thing is, it was supposed to be a through road. And they couldn't do it because someone identified an endangered or threatened wetland flower plant species, right? So when they did that, when some, you want somebody not to be able to build a road or go somewhere, develop an area, find endangered or threatened plants in that area. And it just so happens it's kind of a boggy area, so kind of peat mossy. And uh, it was an area they couldn't develop, so I bought it. So I like that unusable tract of land which can't have anything built on it because of this uh, protected species of plant. So, and I know some of you are gonna wonder what it is. And I thought it was this dwarf iris and there's a white uh, slipper, what's it called? 
white lady slipper of some kind that's little and protected. And here's the part. Uh, if you want to know what's endangered or threatened, or this is also why, by the way, they don't want you to just plant any plants you want on game lands or state controlled land and even federal land, right? Because the species that you put in could create competition for something that's already in jeopardy. Okay. So we don't want to mess with that whole ecosystem, but if you want to help out, they'll tell you plants that you can plant. So they'll let you know what's going on. So it also makes me look up plants that I'm putting on my property. Are they considered invasive? So that's kind of the next stage. If we're looking at flowers that are going to be good for our bees, uh, would they be considered, would they be considered an invasive plant in the area where you reside? So that's a really good check. And again, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources lists those things that are considered invasive. And also when you buy your seeds or you buy your plants, you can get them from areas that are improved, approved, and make sure that they are not going to be invasive. And if you can, plant natives. So we all know, well, we don't. I mean, if you're new today, if this is your first time ever watching, I'm on a real kick for giant hyssop. So I wanted to make sure um, that these uh, seeds, this is from the Everwild company, everwild.com, but purple giant hyssop. So I thought, oh, they better not say that these are invasive or not allowed or not native or something. So I looked them up and sure enough, blue giant hyssop, Agastache, which is exactly what this one is, is native and uh, it's native to North America. So not necessarily already in the state of Pennsylvania, but it's a native plant. This is awesome for bees, so I'm focusing on it. The other thing is um, Maximilians. So Maximilian sunflowers are perennial. I've planted those for years. Last thing I want to do is, is in retrospect, I have to go back and go, oh man, I planted invasives or non-natives. I have to get rid of them. But Maximilians are native. Anise hyssop, also another plant that I've been recommending to people. See, it's good news when something that I've been recommending for a few years turns out to not be a problem, turns out to be one of the good plants. So anise hyssop, also native, beneficial to a wide range of pollinators. So I'm good with the purple giant hyssop and the anise hyssop and uh, agastache. I'm good to go. So that makes me uh, an above average person because the things that I plant there are good. So check in to find out. Uh, don't just plant things because I'm not sure if I used to say this in person or um, if I ever posted a video about it. I hope I didn't, but we used to talk about guerrilla gardening and throwing seed bombs which were like dirt clay balls with seeds embedded in them and like you could drive around town and chuck them into unkept lots and things like that to get some wildflowers growing there and of course the little clod of dirt that they're wrapped in in spring serves to help them germinate and get going and then there you go you have a bunch of flowers where otherwise there's just a bunch of clutter and debris and stuff and areas that are in decay so I'm no longer recommending that. So I'm not telling you to get the seeds that you like and put them in little dirt clods and let them dry out and get a bucket full of them. And I'm not telling you to drive around at, you know, midnight and throw them on lots and in ditches and things like that where you'd like to see a little color. I, I do not want you to do that uh, just before there's three days of rain forecast. Um, so please don't um, throw seed bombs in vacant lots in your town to bring all the color and life where there previously was none. All right, moving on to question number six comes from David, San Marcos, Texas. Second year backyard beekeeper with a single lands hive that is doing well in central Texas. I have a couple of pounds of extra honey from the 2022 spring honey harvest that I would like to feed back to the same hive from where I harvested. I do not care for the flavor of the spring honey harvest, whereas my fall honey harvest is spectacular in flavor. My bees are well provisioned going into winter, so I'm thinking of feeding it back to them in early spring when I add frames to the hive to help offset wax production honey costs. Question is, what is the best way to give harvested honey back to the bees? I have a lands frame feeder. And I have read that diluting the honey with 30% water 
works. So long as it's consumed immediately, lest it ferment, your thoughts would be much appreciated. Okay, so these are my thoughts. These are just my thoughts. So here's the problem with feeding back full strength honey. Now I like that there was one specific thing that was pointed out in here. It's going back to the same hive it came from. So I do not recommend, you know, sharing surplus honey with your friends and fellow beekeepers and stuff like that. Hey, you got some extra honey that you don't like. I'll take it, feed it back to my bees. Please don't because disease can even be transmitted in honey, right? So we're assuming that the hive is healthy in every other way. Now this leads me to how to feed your bees honey. This is an ongoing problem for a lot of people. Honey is dangerous to your bees and I'll explain why. If there is surface area, this is why I don't like the frame honey idea. If your bees get pushed into sugar syrup, one-to-one -one sugar syrup, they can climb back out, they can get out, they get cleaned up by the other bees and they get away. If they get onto the surface of honey, full strength, they get stuck in it and they can drown easily. Once the honey gets on their body, it's very difficult for them to clean it off. If it blocks their um, spiracles on the sides of their body, if that gets blocked up with honey and because the honey is so viscous, bees actually die quicker in open surface honey than almost anything else you put in your hive when it comes to sugar syrup and things like that. So how you deliver full strength honey, and that's what I recommend too, because I don't like the dilution process. That can work, but again, as mentioned here, it has to be consumed then right away. And also you've diluted it, so you've taken down some of its usability for your bees. Because if they can take full strength honey, especially when you're trying to get them to build comb and stuff like that, honey's going to be a fantastic resource because they use a lot of it for that. So my cover shot today, I have a honey feeder idea. Now the problem with the Layens Hive is you don't have a lot of options. So uh, one of the things you can do is on your Layens Hive, because I've been giving this some thought, because the Layens Hive always stalls me when it comes to feeding them. But now we're talking about spring, so we're not worried about putting it directly over the uh, brood area as we would be in the wintertime, for example, for emergency feeding. So the way Layens Hive is laid out, all the backs of the frames compose the inner cover. So the bees can't get on top of it. So then if you, at the end, so in the opposite end of wherever your entrance is, you can make food available. So you can just cut a piece of wood, dimensional lumber, and you'll remove some of those end frames, and then you put a feeder on top of it, and there's a space underneath. I think that's okay because all you're trying to do is feed. When they're done with it, you're going to close it back up and put frames back in. At least that's what I hope you're gonna do. But this is also for those who have other styles of hives. So one of the things I don't like, I do not like jar feeders inside hives. I also don't like bucket feeders inside hives. And now maybe this works in the south somewhere, but I've done the testing and the backyard results come out the same over and over again. In fact, the larger the vessel is, if you invert it, while it's full of sugar syrup, that's fine. But what happens is anytime you have an inverted jar, bucket, quart, any kind of inverted liquid feeder, as the bees consume it, there's an airspace above it inside the bucket, right? So then what happens is, you know, it drops at 30 degrees at night. Now you should not be feeding liquid foods to your bees at a period when it's freezing. But we get those weird days, right? So let's say it's not freezing. Let's say it drops to 45 degrees at night. So what happens is your jar that's got air in the top, the air shrinks, it draws moisture through the jar feeder, and then the bubbles go up and expand inside the jar and then it equalizes. And then what happens in the morning? In the morning, all of a sudden, things warm up. The heat of the uh, air inside your jar expands the air and pushes the syrup out down onto your bees. Now, this is, the, this is the defense of that or the explanation of that by so many feeder designers who I talk to. Well, the bees will keep up with it. They'll just consume it as it goes. You know, it's not a big problem unless it's a little high, and then what's the problem? So just for example, um, I don't like that the feeder is centered over all of your bees because what's going to be down there, your brood. 
What's going to have the surplus liquid dripping down onto it? The brood is. The brood can die easily. You wouldn't know it, right? So when it comes to honey, if that is being expressed out of the jar, then that is going to be a huge challenge to your bees. So here's the thing. I was looking at baby bottles, right? And we've seen these baby bottles. This goes way back to when my sisters were a little drinking out of their baby bottles. They had this new kind of baby bottle that had no bottom on it. In other words, they had these little baggies in them. And the whole point of it was air doesn't get into the baggie. Babies don't get air in their body. They don't burp. They don't get stressed, whatever you know the reasons are. But I was looking at that thinking, huh, why couldn't we do that with inverted feeders inside hives? Then we wouldn't have that air gap building up. And then when it's half, you know, when they're half empty, that's when it really starts speeding up coming out because... I've seen these magical feeders. Uh, all of a sudden it looks like, well, your bees are really drinking a lot of that syrup or the sugar syrup or whatever you've got on. It looks like they're really taking it down because look at that airspace growing. That's how we know they're consuming it. Or is it really just being pushed out? And sometimes you'll see syrup on the bottom board. You'll also see where is your hive? Your hive is sometimes tilted towards the landing board so that water will run out. If your inverted feeders inside that hive drip down onto a solid bottom board and it drips out the front, you're going to kick off a robbing sequence, right? So we're going to have a real problem then. So there must be, so what I've just told people, rapid rounds, they never do that, right? So a feeder design that you could put in there that the bees would keep up with that would never leak. It's just as simple as the baby bottle principle. Because here's the thing. I just took a, this is, happens to be a plastic quart jar. You can get plastic jars that are from peanut butter and things like that. Because I thought about it, let's do the baby bottle thing. If I want to feed 100% honey back to my bees and not put my bees in jeopardy while they consume it, I'm going to line this plastic jar with a plastic bag. Now I know this looks, as kids would say today, that's janky, Mr. Dunn. Okay, well, you know what? It works though. So then if you pour your honey into this bag and fill this jar, and then you put this lid on it, and that forms the gasket and seals it up. And some of you are gonna wonder, what size holes should we put in here? I'm gonna say a 16th of an inch in diameter, and you don't have to make a lot of them, right? Now here's the thing. Now I have a reservoir up here that is lined with a baggie. So I filled it with, in this case, straight honey, because that's what the question from David's relative to. So we fill this bag with honey all the way up to the very top, and then we put the lid on. Now when I put this on, we know that an airspace needs to develop behind the bag in order for it to be consumed by the bees. So I also drilled little holes on the sides of this plastic jar. Now a glass jar, that wouldn't work. Plastic jar, that works. So now I have a bag of honey with holes just like any other jar feeder, and now the bees can consume it and because they're drawing it down, there's no more vacuum happening at night when things get cold. And then in the daytime when things warm up, there's no positive pressure against the bag pushing it out because there's holes in the jar. So we took away the pressure vessel potential of this jar. Now it's just a housing for the honey. And I recommend you don't go bigger than a quart jar. Because I think if you went really big, if you had some capability to put a half gallon jar or something like that on it, uh, we don't have a vacuum anymore in here, and so I don't want it to just push out. And I haven't tested a large vessel. But uh, if you're trying to feed back honey and recover it and use it back for your bees, this is a great way to do it. Plus, if you're in an area where you get these dramatic temperature swings, if you line your jar and make it a plastic jar again because you have to drill holes in it, if you line your jar with a good quality food grade bag and you fill it with that first, now we just took away the risk of expansion forcing the syrup down onto your bees. Nobody makes this right now, but it is a very simple inverted jar feeder that no longer leaks on your bees. I've been talking about this a long time, which is why I just don't use them. But now with a bag in it, now I don't know 
if this will work really well with just sugar syrup. We have to try it with thinner syrups, but definitely it will work with honey, full-blown honey, 18%, 17% moisture, whatever it is. And your bees will drink that down and it will never express itself out and kill your brood and it won't drown your peas. So there you go, right there, just like the baby bottles. It'll work and I can't wait for springtime because I'm going to experiment with that with some others. Why not have a bladder in there that makes sure that air does not get to the syrup that you're trying to feed and it doesn't act on it anymore. I know I'm beating that horse to death right now. That's what I recommend. So for the layers and the same thing for me too. If, if the Layens hive needs to be fed for some reason, because um, that's the other thing, you know, what if they're fully provisioned and when spring happens, you have a narrow window of opportunity to feed that honey back because they're building up their numbers and they're going to be getting the resources from the environment. Although San Marcos, Texas, I don't know what the forage is like there, but you could also feed it back to them during any period of dearth because guess what else they're not going to do during a dearth? They're not going to be building a bunch of new comb. So if you put that board on there at the end of your layens hives, you pull some frames, put the board on, have your feeder on there. I think that will take down that honey pretty fast. Good stuff all the way around. Question number seven. Oh, that's the last of it actually. We're, we're already in the fluff section for today. So I know that uh, this is not bee related. So this is poultry related because um, I'm a poultry technician and I get health alerts, right? So for those of you who are raising chickens, uh, there is something called H5N1, which is avian influenza, high path avian influenza. And often this doesn't show up on your radar at all. They don't even tell you that millions of chickens die from avian influenza. So here's the thing, uh, for those of you with backyard flocks, I'm just gonna mention it really quick. Don't let people come and visit your chicken coops and your yard who also have chickens on their property, who also have chicken coops and things like that. Now, when we get these big numbers, millions of chickens composted, slaughtered because of avian influenza, which a lot of people recognized last year, they were paying $5 for a dozen eggs because there were all these shortages. But if you're a backyard birder, this is a time to keep an eye on your wild bird population. Only feed your bees inside the coop, your bees. Only feed your chickens inside their coops. Uh, so if you have chicken feed, don't feed them out in the yard. Don't feed them in areas common to wild birds, for example, and particularly waterfowl. So we want to keep our chickens around our coops. So food and water inside for them. So anyway, the other thing is um, sometimes people are going around this time of year. Winter's here. No big surprise. And you might be walking around looking at your beehives and you see that there's a little gap somewhere. They didn't quite fit together right. There's been a shift and it's already cold. So we can't go breaking what's remaining of the propolis seal. And uh, you could, but it's going to be very detrimental to your bees. So I'm just going to say there's going to be a link down in the video description to this tree wrap that I use. It's like a green felt. And uh, I started using it a couple of years ago when I had some hives that late in the year. You know, you're doing a thermal scan and you see there's a hot leak on your hive. So then what I do is I'm just wrapping this uh, tree wrap, which is designed to protect your trees from rabbits and things like that. And uh, there's a stainless steel safety pin that you use to secure it once it's wrapped around the hive. It worked very well. So you can wrap that around your beehive. It adds some minor insulation properties, but the biggest thing you want to stop is air from blowing through the damaged parts of your hives. And of course, make a record in spring, you're gonna be swapping out that wooden ware and doing repairs or whatever. So that's part of it. Um, and there are some questions because last Friday, Black Friday, um, I did a live Q and A, just like I'm doing right now, only we had, of course, the live feed and there was the chat, you know, over on the right side of the screen. And, uh, so I asked questions if people wanted it to be live. So you could, of course, talk to each other in the chat and you could post questions as they come to you, you know, while I'm doing this Q&A. And then, uh, so the consensus was kind of even, you know, live chat, no live chat, didn't make much of a difference. But um, what someone suggested was maybe do a live chat once a month so we could plan on it. So I'm asking you now um, if you would like the last Friday Q&A of every month the last Friday of the month, be alive so that you can um, chat with each other and stuff like that. And I realize some people, especially those in other parts of the world, 
that would mean 2 a.m. or midnight or something like that. So I know that's not going to work. But the other part of it is the Q&A will still, of course, be available whenever you are. So it's still going to be out there. It's still going to make it to the podcast. So all of these Q&As are available as a podcast through Podbean. And you just Google podcast the way to be and you'll find it. It's on a lot of different carriers. So that's pretty much it. Uh, the grandson was out cleaning entrances yesterday. So there were a couple that were already plugged up with dead bees. So clean your entrances just in case and be forewarned that if you collect a bunch of dead bees and bring them as he did last night onto the kitchen table, uh, every single one of those bees was actually alive, even though he found them in the snow. So that's pretty much it for today. If you have questions on your mind, please follow the link and go to the waytobe.org and fill out the form there. And uh, that's pretty much all I have for today. So I want to thank you for watching and listening, and I look forward to your future questions and comments. Thanks a lot. Have a fantastic weekend. Mm -hmm.